The word Sati Savitri, in fact, brings before you an image of a bechari mahila, a demure woman. But when you read their stories, they don't come across as that. India's best-selling mythologist Devdutt Patnayak is back, and this time to break myths and narrate the tale of both Sati and Savitri and how they exercise their agency. The renowned author is joining us here on NDTV. Mr. Patnayak, really appreciate your time. Congratulations on this book that I have Thank before me right here. What inspired you to write Sati Savitri and what message do you hope readers take away from it? I wanted to, uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of books which are sort of reimagining ancient mythology, telling the stories using fictional narratives and trying to present uh, ancient views with a modern twist. But I realized most people had not actually read some of the older stories or were access understanding where these stories come from. And the stories by themselves contain so many lovely ideas. I mean, we always hear of how uh, Indian scriptures look at women as daughters, mothers who are subservient to men. But I realize the stories don't say that. When you read the story of a um, Sati or a Savitri or of Damayanti or of Radha, when, I, when you read the stories, the women come across very different. Uh, the conversations which are there in the text are very, very different. They have agency. And I realize younger generation needs to be familiar with what is there in the old books rather than imagining what is there in the old books. And therefore, I wrote this book. And are you of the opinion that... Uh the reading has been largely from the male point of view. And that is the reason why the depiction of women is very different. And when women get to write, they will present a different story. No, I don't think so. Um, that assumes that uh, men are not sensitive to women's issues, that all men are brute, toxic. And it also assumes that women are uh, necessarily, when they write about women, uh, will present women in a positive light. Uh, so th I think this kind of uh, blanket statements and creating a binary doesn't really work. Wise people are there in every uh, generation and the wise do not conform to binaries. Uh, we are a culture where God is seen as incomplete without the goddess. And all the books that say that were written by men. That's the Qurans right. were written by men. So it's the assumption that men will look at women only in a negative light. Hmm. Uh, I think denies men the capability of being wise. Okay. Uh, Mr. Patak, can you really elaborate on the significance of the mythological figures, Sati and Savitri in Indian culture and how their stories continue to resonate even today? So if you look at the story of Sati, she chooses to marry Shiva and she defies her father Daksha who wants her to marry one of the gods. So this is a story of a woman saying that I want to marry the man I choose. Now that's the meaning of the word. The Sati character means that. Or Savitri is an educated woman who goes around the world trying to find a man worthy of her and selects a woodcutter. And her father says, but you know, this man is, is poor, he doesn't have anything, and he's going to die within one year. But she says, it's my choice. I want to marry him. And the father allows her to marry and says, it's your choice. Or Damayanti, whose yeah. husband goes through a nervous breakdown when he loses all his money. And she stands by him and says, you know, why? I will support you. So these women are powerful women who take decisions, choose their husbands, stand by their husbands, even when they become weak and un unable to face world's problems. So I think these are powerful stories which present women very differently. Yes, and there is this paragraph, and uh, I would refer to that, uh, Mr. Patnaik. Lakshmi loves Vishnu more than others. Why? For he understands her need to be free. And he yes. understands the value she brings to the table. She takes away hunger, she provides com comfort, but humans turn food into something else, a tool to indulge the ego and feel superior to other humans by clinging to her, holding her, and not sharing her with others. I mean, that's beautifully put. What challenges did you encounter while interpreting and retelling ancient myths for a modern audience in Sati Savitri? I think uh, the biggest challenge is people's presuppositions, what they imagine these texts say without actually reading the text. They read, they watch what is there on television or they read some literature written by a professor. But the stories themselves, even if you read an Amachitra Katha carefully, 
you realize these women are extremely, you know, when you talk about the story of Lakshmi, Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth. She's called Chanchal. She's free. She has to be wooed. If you trap her or try to force her into your life, she creates trouble for you. She doesn't like being uh, held by force. Hmm. And now this idea that a feminine form should not be held by force is a, is a metaphor at so many different levels, hmm. which I think to understand when you go to South Indian temples, especially in the Deccan region, Vishnu temples will always have an independent temple for Lakshmi. She has her own independent temple all the time. When you go to Puri, Odisha, Lakshmi has a separate temple. When you go to Andhra Pradesh, Lakshmi has a separate temple. You, this idea of a separate independent entity is something that we forget that she is part of the God's life, but she has her own life of her own and this Venn diagram between the male and the female is something that is often forgotten and I wanted to draw attention to that and refer to me as Devdat, not Patnaik. Okay. Devdat. <laughs> yes, Mr. Devdat, I'm looking at another, uh, 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 I should say, page which is 177. It says, in nationalistic reading of the epic, you're reading Ramayana. It says, Sita embodies all things Indian that have been for the past thousand years taken away by Islamic, Christian and Marxist invaders. This is why on Hindutva posters, Ram appears alone in an aggressive stance, bearing a bow, ankles deep in the sea, while Hanuman's face reflects great fury. You're talking about it and you're, giving, you're talking about it in a very beautiful way when you say Sita embodies all things Indian that have been. Yes, see, people imagine the world very differently and different people imagine things differently. Hmm. Uh, you know, the book also talks about, for example, Adhbhuta Ramayana. In hmm. Adhbhuta Ramayana, Sita kills uh, a demon who is even more powerful than Ravan. Ravan has only 10 heads, but she kills this a demon. This one has 100. A hundred, say, some say thousand, yes. basically saying she's allowing Ram to display his valor Tell him that, okay, you can, you, she gives him permission to rescue her, saying that I can take care of myself, but this is a Leela. We are playing the game and I'm allowing you to show your greatness. So these are stories which are written in India by men who are talking about Sita, you know, Sita killing her own captor. She doesn't really need anyone, but she allows people the opportunity to prove their valor. I think these are ideas that we forget, that there is also lots of different ways of looking at the same epic. Uh, there's not one single way of looking at the epic. It's not that women are only oppressed and men are the oppressors. Mm. It also has stories where women are oppressors. They are ambitious and they are cruel. They are human. And because they are human, they have all kinds of positive and negative uh, stories, just as men have positive and negative stories. And I wanted that for the younger generation to know that, you know, there is a complexity in Indian storytelling that is often missing when you tell, you know, the, when people I see on television, a very childish, pedestrian way, which is great, has its own place, but there are other stories that need to be told. And I, I try to bring that voice to the younger generation. Yes, yeah, so that Venn diagram that you're talking about, Mr. Devdath, uh, do you think that Venn diagram essentially is about addressing the role of women in ancient Indian society and what insights do you think our readers can gain, gain from their, uh, these portrayals? I think we should understand, we should ask ourselves, when you see old Krishna statues in Odisha, Krishna is shown wearing a plait, having a piranda, he wears alta in his hand, he, his, he moves his body like a woman, it's called a tribhangi position. It's, he is the purushottama, the ideal man, who expresses himself using female metaphors and forms. So imagine a country like India says Purushottama, the ideal man, embraces the feminine. Otherwise, he's not Purushottama. Hmm. To be Purushottama, you have to embrace the feminine. You have to embrace Radha. And Radha is independent. She survives in Madhuban even when Krishna goes away to Mathura. She doesn't need Krishna to fulfill her. He goes on his journey, she goes on her journey, but they remember each other. And they influence and learn from each other. I think these ideas are there in our scriptures. We have uh, angry women, angry men, happy women, happy men. And I think these uh, kind of ideas, like Purushottama, Krishna, who is also shown in feminine form, 
is an important idea. The idea that, uh, you know, uh, there is a Shiva out there who doesn't understand the world and needs to be educated about the world with, through Uma. His uh, Parvati comes and tells him, what is a household? What is the meaning of property? Why do people are so insecure? How do you deal with this world? Because he is innocent. He doesn't know anything. He's almost like a child and he's being educated by the goddess. These ideas are not there anywhere else in the world. You will never find stories where a goddess is educating a god and telling him how to live a happy life, engaging with the world. You don't find this anywhere. And I have read mythologies from around the world. You do not find such stories where the goddess or the feminine is a teacher. Mm. She is the source of wealth. She's power herself. All things, wealth, power, whether it's economics, whether it's politics, whether it's literature, whether it's art, all that has a very strong feminine side and a feminine uh, take. And I wanted all those ideas in a small book. How, do, how much can you put? But I tried my best. And then you have Kunti. And then you have Kunti. And you have Kunti. Then you have uh, Madri competing with each other. Gandhari yes. competing with them, Satyavati compete, and how the descent of womanhood happens in the Mahabharata. You actually see Ganga who negotiates her life with her husband and at the end you have a woman who is no choice but is forced to marry fine men. She doesn't choose it. Draupadi doesn't have agency. You know, we uh, have to remind ourselves that although Draupadi is seen as a massive feminist character in some circles, hmm. I keep saying she does not choose her husbands. Her life is chosen for chosen, her. Yes. Valorized her because she is vengeful. But And we find that very aggressive and nice. But, you know, Sita is not vengeful at all. She never seeks revenge. She is hoping that Ravan will have the good sense to let her go. But he doesn't have the good sense. She's a quiet one. And it's her children who become kings while Draupadi's children die on the battlefield. And, and in what ways does this book, Sati Savitri, challenge or subvert uh, traditional interpretations of uh, the Sati and Savitri myths? So I don't believe in challenging any myths. I dilute them by presenting more ideas that exist. So people think there's only one idea. And I say, no, there are many ideas. And this is one more idea. I don't believe in uh, challenging any view. I just realize that most people read one book and have a view on India. I have read 100 and I try to share 10 of them. Hmm. And that's what I try to do. And this book is trying to tell people there are different ways. Like, what are the Harappan women like? Who are these Harappan women? What did they do? They are the ones who invented so many things. They had uh, the handi, the lota that we have, the bangles that women wear really were invented by Harappan women. Uh, how different were they from the Vedic women? How were they different from the Tamil women? The Tamil stories of Madhavi, Mani Meghalaya, these stories are not known in North India. North and then Mira of Rajasthan. And there is Meera of Rajasthan. Well, not much about her in my book. She's just mentioned a bit. Because she's not really a mythological character. She's a historical character. Historic. So we have to, I mean, you know, so I have to, while I've mentioned her here and there, it's really Radha who plays a very important role for me because Radha comes in the mythological space. It's an idea. Mythological concepts are more ideas. They are not really physical entities. They are ideas which our ancestors have shared with us. And uh, these women, through these women, so many wonderful ideas are being brought to us. And then you say here, to turn Shiva the hermit into Shankara, the householder, the wild Kali becomes the demure Gauri. So, you know, the role that women have played, uh, you know, in, as you say, we have heard tales of a man taming a sh the shrew, a wild woman. But in Hindu mythology, a key theme is the story of a woman domesticating a man. Yes. So it's mutual. So I've always heard this, that, you know, women are tamed. The taming of the shrew is a very famous play. But the idea that even the men have to be uh, brought into culture. The hermit becomes a householder. The wild goddess becomes a domestic goddess. All these ideas are talking about balance. And they're talking about looking at life in a very large scale. Not in a narrow scale, but in a very wide scale. You know, with the stories of Saraswati, the story of Lakshmi, Durga, Gauri, who are mythological, more mythological, epic women. Uh, Draupadi, Sita, there is Lopa Mudra, wife of Agastya, the wives of the Rishis. The fact that Rishis had wives and, uh, you know, they were uh, demanded things. Lopa Mudra tells her husband that, you know, if you want me to bear your children, you better give money and have a house and have a family. Otherwise, I'm not going to live uh, with you wandering on the streets. So these are demanding women. They are, you know, commanding women, demanding women. Uh, you know, I, I wanted people to be aware of that. Like Shakuntala is raised by a single man. We forget that, you know, Shakuntala is raised by a single man. Sita is a single mother. 
the kunti is a single mother so the idea of a single mother is part of the scriptures uh, you know they are talking about times when there was no marriage they are talking about polygamy polygamy hmm. uh, polyandry these stories exist in the mahabharat in the ramayana in the purans uh, even the artwork that you see on temple walls they tell you so many lovely stories from buddhist art not just hindu but also buddhist and jain i have played a lot of importance to stories of the jain mythology what does it mean when a man becomes a monk and walks away from the wife does the wife support him some wives support some wives turn hostile and i have told stories of these women which are narrated in jain agama literature so Uh, are you of the opinion then that there are visible parallels that we see between stories of Sati Savitri and contemporary issues which are being faced by women in India or globally? So the uh, primary idea in this book is that some things never change. Power struggle has always happened. People struggle with power, gender. Uh, you know, while we look at, we tend to look at the past as patriarchal and feminism as something modern. I want to say that patriarchy and feminism have coexisted in India and in maybe in other parts of the world, but definitely in India. And there has always been this struggle. And as wisdom rises. we give up toxic masculinity and moves towards a more egalitarian society that's what wisdom is all about where we look at you know i say you don't look at the gendered flesh hmm. but at the genderless soul and you start talking to the soul that's what sulabha the, the the nun tells janaka that talk to me as a person don't talk to me as if i'm a woman the conversation is on philosophy and we're talking about atma so we should not be distracted by our flesh now that's a conversation which happened 2000 years ago between sulabha the nun and janaka the king and i think that's a powerful conversation and among all the women who is the most fascinating according to you and and uh, who actually uh, diluted your gendered gaze in mythology well it's always savitri because that's my mother's name So I uh, I have always heard the story of Savitri from my mother and I always found it interesting that we had a story of a woman who outwits death itself. Savitri tricks death and gets her husband back from the jaws of death. Now that's a powerful hero myth if I might say so. But when you read books on heroism nobody talks about Savitri of how she goes and Uh, gets her husband back from the jaws of death so it's a story of not a damsel in distress but a man in distress who needs a sati to protect him and why that's is, a part of the story absolutely why is sati savitri often used together uh people uh, don't really understand these terms the word sati means a good wife that's a general term uh but uh, that's why sati savit it's a title so in the book i've clarified sati can mean a title so you you're called a sati it's a title it's a proper noun it's a common noun it has different meanings um uh, and we, we uh, she's also a, a character in shiva puran she is the first wife of shiva the daughter of daksha so there's that then there is sati anasuya so that's a title you to call a lady a sati if she's a great wife a good wife uh, who enables a husband to survive the difficulties of life without uh, the sati the husband is useless he's frightened he's scared he has no power he has no money it is she who gives him the power and treats teaches him educates him of how to deal with life and these are ideas and that are are these women who are also ready to sacrifice their lives the sati the tradition which used to happen sati and johar these ideas happened only between the 4th and 14th century in certain warrior communities uh, they have been over glamorized in the british era because they enabled the british to tell indians are savages and they need to be uh, you know colonized and educated um, this was a small segment and of course it becomes more glamorous the story is far more glamorous when you talk about a woman and burning herself it makes good trp ratings i guess but in those days whatever was the equivalent but they don't they are not really vedas don't talk about the sati at all there is not a single mention of uh, sati in the vedic literature it's not there it's not it's interpolated in the mahabharata it's not there in the ramayana uh, it's we know that it's interpolated in the mahabharata uh, but comes much 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 later after these stories were told and it's very interesting perhaps there was a warrior community which glamorized this idea or maybe these women didn't want to be abducted and raped and wanted to rather die or there was status associated with it because if a woman did that her surviving family would get lots of wealth and you know power from the neighboring because they'll say that's the family of a sati and that would sort of give them a status or in the 19th century when the bengal it was unfortunately because of 
patriarchy and power and property rights that was uh, the reason for the so there are different reasons why sati happened in uh, bengal in the 19th century in rajasthan it was johar for a totally different reason in the deccan regions they were very different but as i said sati did not exist in the vedas in the ramayana and probably not even in the mahabharat why do you think uh, besides uh, sita and draupadi none of these uh, found uh, space in our conversations about gender dynamics empowerment and agency because nobody talked to devdutt patnaik <laughs> it's that <laughs> you see the books are there it's all there the knowledge is there if you're looking for it i mean the stories of women in the rigveda if i ask you name five women in the rigveda and tell me their stories that's not part of the textbooks is it uh, you know people say that they were interested in indian culture but i'm telling tell me five stories of five women who are mentioned in the rigveda and the story of urvashi the story of you know do you know the story of urvashi do we know the story of lopamudra do we know the story of apala these are all characters from the rigveda not even the upanishads when you come to the upanishads there are women uh, what about the women in harappan cities who have we don't know their names they are there out there if you look at the mahabharata just go to the index page and there are so many women out there hmm. uh, you know ramayan mahabharata of course is popular stories and therefore people paid attention but if you go to different parts of india there are like tamil nadu will have kandagi but if hmm. you go to north nobody knows about kandagi they don't know about mani meghalaya they don't know about uh, madhavi they don't know about the courtesans who uh, you know when you read buddhist literature you have amrapali uh, the courtesan who funds a uh, you know monastery for buddha and you know and uh, welcomes him to her house she's rich she's independent we don't know about the courtesan culture which was erased by the british after 1857 because these women uh, supported the uprising and the independence uh, battle and they were erased out of history even today they are not part of our textbooks we don't remember them at all Uh, so you know, unfortunately, the regional stories have also been forgotten. The Odisha has stories, Maharashtra has stories of women, Karnataka has stories of women. I've captured some of them, not been able to capture all of them because you know I want to make it a simple, easy, readable book. But I think it just get the younger generation interested that there are women out there, and there are many, many women out there about whom we don't talk about, and that's why it is you know other feminist stories they don't tell you because they didn't tell me. and i don't want the next generation to say that you know nobody from my generation bothered to do the research and share these pearls with them what is evident here is that there's a lot of research that has went into uh, crafting this narrative so thank you so much and congratulations for this book and for thank the you. viewers uh, the final word from devdutt patnaik what will it be it will be that you know remember that there are more stories about women than anybody told you and it's not just in the ramayana and mahabharat it is in the purans it is in the shastras it is in the vedas go out there find these pearls and if you can't do that just read my book all right thank you so much for speaking to ndtv